For over 30 years now, Monday Night Raw has been the flagship of WWE programming, with it regularly being the place the biggest stars will congregate and carry out the next chapter of whatever ongoing storyline they're involved in. But who are the greatest superstars in Raw history? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. And where better to start than with Stone Cold Steve Austin? Yes, you could make a very solid argument that of all the wrestlers who have ever appeared on Raw over the years, none are more closely associated with the show than the Rattlesnake is. After all, it was his antics which made Monday Night's appointment viewing for fans back in the late 90s. Sure, Raw had been popular to some degree before that, but it wasn't until Austin got going that things really reached the next level, the mainstream level. How did he do this? Well, primarily through his feud with Vince McMahon a feud which went on for the better part of two years and gave us such classic moments as Stone Cold riding his Zamboni down to the ring, Stone Cold taking over WWF headquarters as its new CEO, and of course, Stone Cold giving the corporation a beer bath. And whenever he wasn't involved in memorable segments like these, the Rattlesnake was throwing in the odd match here and there on Monday nights, like the time he beat Kane to win the WWF title in June of 1998. Really, to this day, it's a period which is probably still the highest high the company has ever reached, and a large part of the reason for that can be put down to the way Steve Austin was able to make Raw his own personal playground for a while there. And even once the Attitude Era was over, he still continued to make it his show for the most part when, post-retirement, he became the on-screen sheriff in 2003, with this period allowing him to remain there feuding with Eric Bischoff for a while, even if he was no longer active in the ring. Then there's also the occasional one-off appearances he's made in the years since, each of which have drawn monster reactions from fans and only further solidified that, at the end of the day, Raw remains the Stone Cold Show. And it remains the Stone Cold Show because he did such a great job of giving the identity of being the place to be if you wanted to see good wrestling at the turn of the millennium. But Steve Austin wasn't the only person who was helping to give Monday Nights this identity back in the late 90s and early 2000s, because there was another one who was arguably doing so on the same level as even him at this point, and that was The Rock. Now, we don't need to explain to you who The Rock is. After all, he's one of the biggest names not only in wrestling, but also in Hollywood. He's a 10-time world champion, member of the board of TKO, and a star of hit franchises like The Fast and the Furious. But while his home has now largely become the glitz and glamour of the movie stage, before any of that, it was Raw where he held court more often than not. Sure, you could argue he's more of a SmackDown guy as that show is literally named after him and saw some of his biggest moments take place, but years before the blue brand ever existed, Dwayne Johnson was turning himself into a phenomenon and the place he was doing this was on Monday nights. Need any example? How about the time he acknowledged the Die Rocky Die chance and became the newest member of the Nation of Domination in 1997? And if that's not enough for you, then how about the period in 2000 where, with Steve Austin out injured, he became the man to carry the company on his shoulders as its top babyface? Of course, those are just two moments out of many, and if we wanted to, we could be here all day listing off times The Rock made Raw essential viewing. After all, we've not even talked about his generational feud with Steve Austin yet, or his tag team with Mick Foley, The Rock and Sock Connection. Hell, it was that latter pairing which gave us one of the highest rated moments in the show's history when, on the September 24th, 1999 episode, Mankind put on a This Is Your Life segment for The Great One, a segment which saw him be visited by names from the past such as old high school girlfriends and football coaches. Even today you'd be hard pressed to find something which could draw in as many viewers as this one did. But it's not just the turn of the millennium era which makes The Rock such an all-time great Raw superstar, as there's also his return to WWE in 2011 to have a three-year-long program which someone will get to in a moment, a program which saw the company get some of the highest levels of interest it had in years. And no surprises for guessing then that the majority of the segments between these two took place on Monday nights. Who was that other person in this feud? Well, it was none other than our next subject, the man who took up the mantle of the face of the company after Austin and Rock left, John Cena. That's right, during the heights of the ruthless aggression and PG eras, there was no one on WWE TV more focused upon, more celebrated than John Cena. And because he was such a big deal then, it should come as no surprise that the majority of his run was spent on Raw. Yes, we know he did first come to prominence on SmackDown during the early 2000s, 
but if you ever needed any evidence that the red brand was the A-show back then, you only need to look to the fact that once it became clear the West Newbury native was going to be the star player going forward, he was immediately moved over to Monday nights full time. And it was on Monday nights that we got to see him carry the flag for WWE for almost two decades, in the process having memorable feuds against the likes of Edge, The Rock, and a few other people will come to soon enough. In fact, you could argue that since the era of Stone Cold, there has been no one person who's been more associated with Raw than Big Match John. Yes, even during the darkest days of the company creatively, he was always there to keep some degree of fan interest with his kid-friendly antics and his winning ways. No, he might not have been the most popular with adults for the most part, but this wasn't an era of WWE for them. Rather, it was an era where the company were aiming for a much younger audience, something Cena worked perfectly for. Basically, he was their 2000s and 2010s Hulk Hogan-like superhero. And this was evident whenever he showed up to work on a Monday night and was forced to try and overcome insurmountable odds in the face of rivals like Umaga, The Nexus, and Brock Lesnar. Of course, like the hero he was, he always won the bout in the end and kept the fans who were watching happy, usually as the reigning and defending WWE Champion. Were there low points to his run? Sure, but that doesn't take away from the fact that when all is said and done, John Cena deserves to be on a video about the greats of Raw, just as our next subject deserves the same thing. That's right, it's time to talk about Bret Hart. Yes, during the new generation era, a difficult time for WWF both financially and creatively, they decided the best thing to do to try and give themselves a shot in the arm was to add a new weekly show to their lineup, one which would feature a different way of doing wrestling television and this show turned out to be Monday Night Raw. But with Hulk Hogan effectively being gone by then, and with other big stars of the golden era also mostly being out of the door, it meant it was left to the next crop of upcoming names to establish what Raw was going to be. Luckily then, WWF had Bret Hart on the roster, and so he was able to turn Monday nights into a place where you could see good wrestling. And because of that, he has to be considered an all-time great of the show, as had it not been for him being there during its early days, who knows if it would have survived. But then, it's not just the early days of Raw the Hitman deserves credit for helping save, as flashing forward a few years to 1997, this was the year where the company very nearly went out of business. And it likely would have if it weren't for the product suddenly starting to catch fire. Of course, while you could credit part of this turnaround to Steve Austin, a large part of the credit also deserves to go to Brett too, as it was his heel but not really a heel character which helped to make Raw in 1997 arguably the best year of television WWE ever produced. Everything Brett did and said back then made sense in its own way, and if you felt inclined, you could easily have cheered for him as he waged war on the hypocrisy of both fans and the rest of the babyface roster. Truly, it was a joy to watch and gave us some classic moments such as him shoving Vince McMahon down on the March 17, 1997 episode of the show and calling the whole situation BS. Basically, if you enjoy the character work that a Drew McIntyre or a Hangman Adam Page are putting out today, then you can thank the Hitman for this as he laid down the template back during the Proto-Attitude Era Raw. That said, he wasn't the only person who was helping to make the show great during that era, as the same thing could be said for his career rival, Shawn Michaels. Yes, whenever we talk about Bret Hart, the Heartbreak Kid has to come up eventually, as each are so closely intertwined. And that was never clearer than on 1997 Raw, as it was there their feud reached nuclear levels, the kind of levels which would make CM Punk and the Elite blush. Remember the infamous Sunny Days segment from HBK? That took place on Raw during this year, and it wasn't the only dig he fired at the Hitman then either. That said, Shawn Michaels' case for being one of the greats of Raw is down to a lot more than just one feud, as prior to this he was also helping to establish the show in its early days. And once a serious back injury forced him out of the ring for four years, he'd eventually return to make the show exciting all over again during the Ruthless Aggression era too. In fact, you could argue that it was this second run on the Red Brand which fully solidified Shawn as not only a great of the show, but also a true great of the industry overall as now, without his personal problems holding him down, he was finally able to reach his final form. And that final form was a man who could knock it out of the park each and every week, either by taking part in great matches such as the hour-long bout he had with John Cena on the April 23, 2007 episode of the show, or by involving himself in fun, child-friendly segments such as he did during the second run of D-Generation X. Honestly, while he might have been better known as Mr. WrestleMania, calling the San Antonio native Mr. Monday Night wouldn't be out of order either, no disrespect to Rob Van Dam of course. 
After all, the amount of quality performances he's put in on Raw over the years is staggering, and just further evidence of why he deserves to be remembered as well as he is. But what about someone very close to him who has their own claim to being an all-time great of the Red Brand? Surely it's time to talk about them for a while. Yes, we couldn't go the whole video without bringing up the subject of Triple H. Okay, we know what you're all thinking. Wasn't Triple H's reign of terror one of the lowest points for Raw in its three decade plus long history? Well, sure, there were certainly low points, but that doesn't mean Paul Levesque hasn't helped to make Monday nights great over the years too. After all, have we forgotten about WWE in 2000, the year where for many the company was at its absolute peak? That was the year of Triple H being probably the best wrestler in the world. And if you wanted to see him be the best in the world at this time, then the place to do so was on the Red Brand, where he'd spent a large portion of his time holding the WWF title and feuding with the likes of The Rock and Kurt Angle. Then of course there's the post Reign of Terror era, the period where following the climax of the Evolution storyline, which saw the game put over Batista strong in one of the best angles of the era, he went on to reform D-Generation X for a while, the same group he'd first dominated Raw with back during the Attitude Era. And as if that weren't enough, there were his later programs with John Cena, Randy Orton, and The Undertaker too. But even that isn't the end of the reasons we have for Triple H being in today's video, as once he semi-retired from the ring, he continued to serve a key role on Monday nights as the on-screen authority figure, a role he took on to reflect his real-life segue into a management position. Yes, never let it go forgotten that this was the run which gave us things like the Yes Movement and the debut of Sting. Hell, even the Reign of Terror itself had some great matches and moments during his feuds with the likes of Rob Van Dam, Booker T, and Goldberg. No, they didn't always end well, but there were some nuggets of gold hidden within them. And for that reason alone, they can't entirely be discounted. In fact, it was one of these feuds which helped to establish our next subject as a major player and future GOAT of Raw in his own right. Who are we talking about here? Why, Randy Orton, of course. Now, when it comes to Randy Orton, it's easy to forget about him in terms of Raw's greats, as he's been such a constant presence on WWE TV for so long, performing at such a high level that he's almost taken for granted. But when we're looking at the best to ever do it on the flagship, we can't not include him, as he's given us so many great moments there over the years. Yes, it was on Monday nights that the Viper first showed he was a future star in waiting as a member of Evolution, and it was on that same show that he became the youngest world champion in WWE history. Then, as if this weren't enough, it was also there that he created his Legend Killer gimmick, a gimmick which eventually saw him come perilously close to ending The Undertaker's streak at WrestleMania 21. Still not convinced of Randy's red brand greatness? Well, how about the fact he was also able to dominate the tag team division there for a while as one half of Rated RKO alongside Edge? And after that was over, he segued right back into the main event scene with his fantastic heel character during the Age of Orton storyline. And that only takes us up to the 2000s. That's right, we still have almost two full decades of the Viper on Raw following this, with the legendary moments he created during that time being countless. The Authority, RK Bro, the numerous other WWE title runs, there's nothing Orton hasn't done on Monday nights at this point. And with it not looking like he's going to be stopping anytime soon, who knows what else he'll achieve before all is said and done. Maybe at the end of the day, when everything is gathered and collected, he'll be remembered as the undisputed greatest of all time when it comes to Raw. That said, if he wants to reach this level, then he's going to have some competition from our next subject, someone who just recently returned to WWE looking to re-establish their own legacy. Who are we talking about this time? Who else but CM Punk? That's right, ever since he sat down cross-legged on the entrance ramp on the June 27, 2011 episode of The Red Brand and cut his now iconic pipe bomb promo, CM Punk has been one of the most talked about figures in all of wrestling. And so much of the stuff he'd done in the years since has also happened on Raw too. Winning the WWE title, then walking out of the company in what was dubbed the second summer of Punk? Check. Yes, that happened while he was a member of the Raw roster, as did his later 434-day run with that same belt. Of course, this run created many memorable moments within it as well then as it saw the voice of the voiceless feud with figures such as Daniel Bryan, Chris Jericho, and The Rock. And even when this run came to an end, Punk continued to hold down the fort on Monday nights for a couple more years, there getting into arguably equally as important programs against the likes of Brock Lesnar and The Shield. Sure, it would all come crashing down when he quit the company for real in 2014, and from there, spent the next seven years being a ghost as far as the industry was concerned. 
but following his run in AEW, Hell has since frozen over, and he's now returned to WWE, and more specifically, to Raw. How will this run go, and what impact will it have on his overall status as an all-time great of the red brand? We guess we'll just have to see how things go when he returns from injury and gets into a long-awaited feud with our next subject. No, we're not talking about Drew McIntyre. Rather, we're talking about Seth Rollins. Yes, of all the members of The Shield who took over WWE TV during the mid-2010s, arguably none have made their stamp on Monday nights in quite the same way as The Architect has. And that's because while all three, namely he, Roman Reigns, and Jon Moxley, have spent their fair share of time on both major WWE shows, in recent years, Reigns has become more of a SmackDown guy, all while Mox has found a new home over in AEW. So this has meant Raw was able to morph from being the show run by people like Triple H and John Cena into Monday Night Rollins instead, the three-hour block where every week the Iowa native proves why he's still one of the best in the world. How has he done that exactly? Well, by having great matches on an almost weekly basis. That and by having multiple reigns as world champion. That's right, whether it be the WWE title, Universal title, or the new World Heavyweight title, there has been no one more dependable on the red brand than Seth Rollins when it comes to holding down Fort with the top prize. And that's exactly why he's been put in this position so often. Hell, as it stands today, he's currently the only person to have ever held the aforementioned revived World Heavyweight title. And during his run with this, he's given us some very memorable moments and matches against opponents such as Finn Balor, AJ Styles, and Shinsuke Nakamura, basically the early 2010s roster of New Japan Pro Wrestling. Of course, it's not just his time as world champion that's made his runs on Raw so special though, as he's also at points helped to elevate mid-card straps such as the Intercontinental title. And when he hasn't been doing that, he's been doing other things like teaming up with his wife Becky Lynch to take part in mixed tag team feuds or creating new characters such as the Drip God or the Monday Night Messiah. And let's take care to not understate just how big of a deal The Shield were in helping to make Raw feel exciting again from late 2012 onwards, as were it not for them showing up every week and destroying anyone they felt deserved their wrath, the show might have been entirely unwatchable. All this is to say, then, that when the book is finally written on Raw, Seth Rollins will be right there amongst the other great performers of the brand. In fact, he might even be right next to our next subject, none other than Chris Jericho. Why is Chris Jericho on our list of all-time greats when it comes to the red brand? Well, because like with everyone else we've looked at today, he's done so many great things there. Hell, his very first night in WWE happened on the August 9th, 1999 episode of the show and that would end up going down in history as one of the best debuts of all time. Then, of course, there's his numerous other Monday Night highlights over the years, highlights such as him becoming the first ever undisputed champion in 2001 while a member of its roster, having a great phantom title win over Triple H on the April 17th, 2000 edition, and taking part in an excellent first feud with Shawn Michaels around the time of WrestleMania 19. But that still wouldn't be all because after this, once the brand extension formally became a thing, he'd spend most of his time on the flagship, having amongst other things, a memorable program with Christian, the honor of getting the on-screen credit for creating the then Raw exclusive Elimination Chamber, and an all-time classic pitting him and Chris Benoit against Stone Cold Steve Austin and Triple H for the tag team titles on the May 21st, 2001 edition of the show. You know, the one where the game tore his quad. Sure, after that, he'd take some time away from wrestling, but once he returned again in 2007, he'd pick right back up where he left off by having a career highlight feud with Shawn Michaels. And when that was done, there were further excellent programs against performers as wide and varied as CM Punk, AJ Styles, and Kevin Owens. Hell, it was that latter program which gave us one of the best segments in Raw history, the Festival of Friendship, a true diamond in the rough that was 2017 WWE. No, the way things stand right now, it doesn't look like he's going to be returning to the red brand anytime soon. But even if he never sets foot in a Raw ring again, the Demo God's place as one of the best to ever appear there is secure anyway, just as everyone else we've discussed today can also say their spots as Goats of Raw are secure too. <laughs>